The following is a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! Go Cowboys! This, this is Talkin' Cowboys. Streaming live from the Dallas Cowboys World Headquarters at the Star in Frisco. Pollard streaks in! Streaks in! Touchdown! Parsons has second! Prescott keeps it! And he bangs it in for the touchdown! And now your hosts, Isaiah Stanback, Nick Harris, John Mashoda and Kyle Yeomans. It's a Thursday edition of Talking Cowboys presented by Black Rifle Coffee Company live from the star in Frisco in the SWBC studios. It is a Thursday, which means we're breaking down the Cowboys offensive preview against the New York Jets in week two of the NFL season. Here with Nick Harris, John Machoda, Isaiah Stanback. I'm Kyle Yeomans. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Feeling pretty good. Pick play. Getting ready for week two, and this is the this is really the the preview day that I've been looking forward to because the Jets defense has some pieces. I mean, they are they are loaded, no doubt about it. And and of course, we talked yesterday about the Jets offense versus the Cowboys defense. The Cowboys defense is exceptionally loaded, but now you've got the Jets defense to, to talk about. We'll see how the Cowboys offense can adjust. But I want to start things off with a little news and notes. We've done this quite a few times on top. I'm talking Cowboys, but I'll hand things over to Nick Harris. Give me the news and notes of yesterday. Cowboys back on the practice field just a tiny bit. Kind of. <laughs> Not really practice full. Field. Yeah, practice. Uh, I mean, it was just kind of a it was a mock walkthrough, so a mock game and a walkthrough. Uh, but there was some news that came out of Mike McCarthy's press conference yesterday. Yeah, so they gave a, uh, a practice estimate report, which is basically saying if they were in a full practice, this is how much certain guys would have practiced. And a, no- a notable addition to that list was Brandon Cooks, uh, who's dealing with a knee issue, um, apparently. So uh, we were able to talk to Mike McCarthy about it. Uh, he said that he's going to try to do a little bit more today, talking about Thursday. Um, and then hope he said he's got a chance to, to, to play on Sunday. So, um, you know, and, and talking to Brandon Cooks in the locker room after he was very kind of hush hush about everything. He was like, yeah, I'll just like coach speak on that. And, you know, I feel good. And, you know, we'll see where we go from here. So uh, it looks like it's just like a nagging recovery. As far as I can tell, that's my personal perspective of it. Um, you know, if he if he can't go on Sunday, I think that makes, you know, some things interesting for the receiving core. Um, and we lost our host, you know, so we've we've lost a receiver and we've lost our host today. It's just it's, it's it's been bad. I found it interesting how he answered that question about how multiple times he was asked, and he said, well, yeah, you're going to have to ask Coach about that or whatever. I'm just yeah. not used to players saying that, so I don't know if that's a – he's used to doing that at other stops in his career whenever there's been injuries, but I found that interesting how there's multiple times it was circled back on, like, his possibilities of playing and everything like that, and he didn't reveal anything. So, of course, when we, like, leave the locker room, I go back. I'm like, let me just see when – when's the last time he was out on the field? And it's the play right before – Turpin's touchdown to make it 40 to nothing and so he left basically when all the rest of the starters yeah. left it wasn't like he oh he did something in the first half and then you know we didn't see him in the second half I mean that would have you know raised some red flags but he was out there till when they pulled Dak and everybody else like so I don't know and a lot of Texans beat writers were kind of coming to Twitter yesterday being like mm-hmm. oh yeah it's, it's Brandon Cook's Wednesday day off like he does this and we were like <laughs> okay good context I guess but I, I I do feel like there's an actual injury going on here just because of the the way McCarthy communicated it yesterday but I guess that's something to keep in mind it was like yeah like Brandon Cooks took a few Wednesdays off last year so yeah. just a veterans day off he's a 10-year guy he can do that so did you ever take a veterans day off Isaiah <laughs> no. did you ever get a chance to take take no, the, the kick the feet up a little bit you're telling me a senior at UW you weren't, you know, coming into mm, practice ten minutes listen, late. Man, that was my get money year. I had no time to be taking breaks. <laughs> yeah, no, no I doubt. Respect that. <laughs> uh, how much could missing Brandon Cooks this week? I, I there's not a ton of concern. At least it doesn't seem like it for Mike McCarthy. There was a little bit of concern when he said, "Yeah, he should be able to go." It's like, okay, I don't like the word "should." No, I think uh, he said "chance." He's okay, had a chance. To play. Even yeah. uh, even he, worse, <laughs> right? Honestly. Uh, so the, the the wordage isn't necessarily great, but I, I still have confidence that that you'll see number three out there. But if he's not out there, Isaiah, how can that change things? Not drastically this week, to be honest with you. Really, um, this defense is not. It's not really a man-to-man defense. These guys like to play a lot of zone. Um, so with that being the case, I'm not saying that B. Cooks is just like any other receiver on this team because it's obviously not the case. But, you know, we have other guys that could be serviceable against this particular type of defense. So Michael Gallup can have a day against these guys. Even Tolbert can have a day against these guys. So should B. Cooks be missing, obviously you'll miss him. But there's other guys that can still get the job done for sure. 
What do you think about some of the other injuries that were kind of addressed? I mean, Donovan Wilson still trying to work back. He did not practice yesterday. Tyron Smith was a full participant with the ankle in practice, so that was a good sign. And then uh, you're, you're still looking for maybe Jordan Lewis to, to get back in the fold this week. What do you think about some of those things? It's, Lewis was active yep. uh, all week last week, but then he was inactive for the game. I want to start with Tyler Smith uh, just because sure. it's starting to feel like he won't play on Sunday again. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever we asked uh, Mike McCarthy yesterday about it, he's like, Dono's closer than Tyler, which, um, you know, Dono's been dealing with the injury a little bit longer. And, you know, if there's a clear echelon there, then that probably means that, you know, he's probably down a little bit further than we would probably want him to be. And then later in the press conference, he was asked about Chuma Idoga's performance last week. And he's like, yeah, you know, he stepped up to the plate. He should be much more prepared this week now that he's got the full week. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I, I think they're preparing Chuma again for week two. Um, but as far as Tyron Smith, looks like he's good to go. You know, full participant yesterday in the estimate. Um, and then Donovan Wilson would love to see his debut. But again, as we spoke on it yesterday, like if it's, if you if you feel like you're pushing it, there's no need, there's no need to so um you know this defense proved that they're more than capable of you know doing things without him and jordan uh, but would love to get those guys back on the field as soon as possible you still look concerned without tyler smith in the fold i would like to have him versus this front Mm -hmm. i really would um reason being these these guys are they're pretty big humans and they're pretty strong humans and really their way of pass rush is bull rush that's their form of that's their style that they choose right dallas's style is stunts speed you know beat you vertically um or confuse you versus these guys are really just lying up and we're just going to push you back into the quarterback um i obviously that is the strength of tyler smith he can sit up there and and, and be brolic with the big with the biggest guys in the league so definitely will miss most likely miss that presence um too many doga it has good size to him um and hopefully he can Hopefully he can buckle up his chin strap because he's going to need it. Yeah, this is his old team. He's going to be ready to go. Is that what it is? He's going to he's going to play play well against him. I mean, Jonathan Hankins played against his team last week that, that drafted him and he played pretty well. So that's pretty sound reasoning overall. That's the that's the thing that sucks about the offensive line. You can't interchange guys based upon best matchups. No. You know, you need chemistry. You know, if I was, if you were able to interchange guys and chemistry wasn't really a factor, uh, then I would put T.J. Bass in this game. Because T.J. Bass is bigger, in my opinion, he's he's a big, bigger, more brolic, uh, kind of road grader type of guy, right? Like wants to get in there, fisticuffs, old school Irishman, right? Like <clears throat> I think that's his style, and I think that will work well against this defensive front. Chumi Doga, I think he should be serviceable as well, you know, being based upon his size. Um, I think he has problems when guys are able to move and get around him, right? So um, this is going to be in a phone booth. This is going to be strength on strength and who can really hunker down and put their foot in the ground, which also makes you want to turn your attention towards um, Tyron Smith and find out how, how strong that ankle is. How would you feel like he played in week one? I feel like he did really pretty, yeah. pretty good. I feel like he did pretty good. But, again, you know, that's that style of rush that he that that we dealt with last week is not what he's going to see this week. It's different, like, yeah, it's totally different. What did you think about Tyron Smith? Yeah, uh, really solid. I thought it was a sound effort, you know, all, all the way um, from. Um uh, both tackles with Tyron and Terrence. Uh, yeah, Terrence had one bad penalty, but other than that, it was it was mostly pretty clean. Um, you know, I didn't love Biotish's performance. I, I know we talked about that, but the more I've gone back to watch film from that game, the more I see Biotish calling out things pre-snap, and that mm-hmm. just I, I love to see that. Like that's that's invaluable. But as far as post-snap, I, I feel like he could have cleaned some things up and had a better day overall. Um, but Tyron, uh, overall, I, I felt like he performed well. Um, I, my expectation for him, it was met. I wouldn't say it was exceeded, but it was met. So. Yeah, and I think there's ways that they can still see an uptick. I mean, you were able to pave the way for the run early. You were able to get things going on the ground initially, and then the game was out of hand at that point, so it didn't really matter toward the back end. But I want to talk about the run game specifically this week because it's not going to be easy to run against this front. And, John, I mean, we've talked at at nauseum about the number two and number three running backs, Rico Dowdle and, uh, of course, Deuce Vaughn. But – Tony Pollard, he was limited. He had the two touchdowns, sounded good. He didn't have to do a whole lot. Do you expect more out of Tony Pollard just from a usage standpoint in week two than you did in week one or you saw in week one? Not much. Yeah. No, I I don't. Um, I think, if anything, you might see more of Rico Dowdle. Maybe you see more Deuce Vaughn. Uh, I could see Turpin getting a similar workload. So uh, I guess it depends on how the game goes, you know. if there's certain situations where they just feel they're way better off with Tony Pollard out there, they they will be. But I just I don't get the sense at all that they're going to be throwing him out there for 20, 25 carries a game. I, yeah. I I just really don't. I think he's too valuable for the for the long haul, 
and what he can bring them in January. So I think that it's going to be managed to where he's out there in, in the right situations. And obviously that was the case on Sunday. They didn't have to give him the huge workload, but I think he had, I want to say like maybe 18 touches. I can give you a for sure. I think it was around 18, 18 <clears throat> he had four, touches. 14 attempts and he had two receptions. Okay, so, so 16. 16 touches, yeah. Yeah, I think that. That's about right. Yeah, keep that around 20. Yeah, and then Dowdle had six carries, did not have a target. Uh, Turpin, of course, had three carries. He had the touchdown. Do you like the the wrinkle of Turpin being thrown in there as a running back? I mean, we talked about it a little bit on hit sticks earlier this week, but he's not a running back, but they can use him in that that standpoint, kind of the same way you, they use Deuce Vaughn in certain situations. Well, if he's in the, if, he, if he's in on the field, he's not pass blocking. I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I do like to, I like it for two reasons. I like it from the standpoint that you're taking carries off of Tony Pollard mm-hmm. because they favor each other in, in their dynamic their dynamic ability to make a big play, right? And if, in terms of trying to outflank and use your speed and hit the hole and get up there and make somebody miss. So if you're going to have somebody that can take carries off him and you can get the same effectiveness from that standpoint, then why not? Um, um, and then from the other standpoint, the, that you keep guys on their toes and you find a way to get the ball into your playmaker's hands. Um, you know, Turpin is, is a supreme runner, right, with the ball in his hand. He, he just is. You know, you don't have to really worry about it except for the preseason game about him fumbling. Uh, so you can trust him in that regard, and he's going to make – he's going to be a matchup nightmare. Now, once he comes into the game, personnel-wise, you know, when you're in a huddle, that's, what's how, that's how defenses are – are are scripting right um let me back up a defensive coordinator sitting in the booth he's watching players come on the field as soon as he sees what players come on the field for the offense now he's calling his defense based upon the guys that are coming in for offense so if you see turpin coming in okay obviously you have a four receivers on the field at one time okay now you're sending out your dime but all of a sudden turpin lines up in the backfield oh crap Right now yep. we're now we're in a bad situation, right? So it's a mismatch nightmare for teams. And yes, they're gonna still try to match up based upon personnel. But when he lines up in the backfield, now all of a sudden you only got five guys in the box. You have some things to worry about. Do you love it still in goal line situations? Because I, <clears throat> I figure him being as a running back, it would be most effective between the thirties. Get him out in the open field where he can break off and get loose with a big hole. But in the goal line where everything's much more compact, I think he was only one for three on goal line opportunities on Sunday. So I don't know if I love goal line, but do you do you have the same sentiment? I don't have a issue with it because okay. you think about it from like what. This is gonna sound bad. Somebody's gonna take offense to this, but what does Tony Pollard provide for you on the goal line that Turpin doesn't? A little bit more physicality. Yeah, yeah, more size. I mean, when's the last time you saw Tony Pollard run through somebody? Uh, on Sunday. I mean, I mean, on Sunday on the goal line. I mean, <laughs> He'll run through somebody. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying somebody. that he can't, but I'm saying that's not his thing. I mean, I'm saying if you want to run no, through somebody, you put, you, put, you put Rico in the game, yeah. right? You want to talk about somebody running in tight spaces? Well, Turpin's kind of your guy, right? What does he do as a punt returner? You run through tight spaces, yeah. right? So I mean, so it's not like he has an inability to be able to run the ball down there. Sure. It's just out of the, it's out of the box thinking. And people are struggling with that. And I, and I liked how you mentioned just him even having him out there, what it does for opposing defenses that are watching it, because there were some plays in that game that maybe they didn't have the biggest success, but like the Dak keeper down in down in the red zone off when he ran to the left, like, yeah, did they score a touchdown? No, but you like that they're still showing, hey, you have to account for the quarterback here. It's Yeah, is he running like 2016? No, but you still have to account for it. We're still going to show that. Yep. And probably my favorite play in the game was, this, was the screen to Pollard. I know he fumbled, but the way they brought um, CD in motion and then he circled around the gun and then came back out still to the left. Like, they didn't throw to CD, but it is the most – that's the playmaker you worry the most about in defense. Yep. And it still did enough to, like, draw some attention there so then they could throw the screen back to the right like that. Like, yeah, they didn't throw to CD, but you can off of that. And just to put that out there, there was just – there was a few plays in there that I, I just really liked. That, yeah, like I said, it didn't hit big, but you can see what – some big things that could come off of it. No, I think that's oh, that that creativity is what we've been waiting for. We were talking about it on Thursday last week of get the screen game going. I mean, get it get it rolling, and you're going to use it with Turpin. You're going to use it with Pollard. You're going to use it with Deuce Vaughn, and those are going to be guys that that the screen game allows uh, or that allow the screen game to open up. You also need a healthy offensive line to, to have some success in that Absolutely. screen game where you like from week to week maybe you have the same five guys. I know this is crazy. What's that? Yeah, I know, I know, but it happens sometimes. But if you have that, I like I just wonder you. how much continuity there really was, maybe and I mean, let's be honest, since Mike McCarthy's been the head coach, they just really not had no. some good health in the offensive line. I think having, you know, several weeks in a row with Tyron out there, Terrence Steele, Zach, yeah, I think that could be 
that could help the screen game as well. Yeah, we need to buy like a wood plank. We we knock on this. You thing don't think every... that's what do you think that is? I, I think it's like plywood. I'm like it's just okay. It's just there. Which I mean, it's got wood, wood in the name, so I mean, I think it should work. Uh, but I, I agree with you. I think a healthy offensive line is always going to help this offense move forward, but you can't count on that. And we've that's why we had a problem with the offensive line depth at the beginning. At, at the beginning of the year, and now you're already seeing it with Tyler Smith and Tyron Smith last week. There was a bit of a scare. Luckily, Chuma Adoga came back in and, and did a nice job. Tyron Smith was healthy enough to play. It looks like that'll be the case going into week two, but you still don't necessarily feel comfortable with it. But it just it opens so many things up. If you can have all five of those guys up front, it's a completely different ball game. Uh, and and we're talking and nitpicking on an offense that won thirty or I mean excuse me forty to nothing in week one. A lot of that came from the defense and the special teams. Of course, we know that. But the offense did some some good stuff too, and they were able to put drives together. They were able to make it look good and. Isaiah even talked about it prior to, to really the, the introduction to the West Coast offense. It's not always pretty, and nor will it be, but it's going to get the job done because yeah. it's supposed to help you help your defense and be complementary to the other two units. Absolutely, and you're going to see more of that. I really, I truly believe that you're going to see more of that. However, I think it's going to be a completely different approach this week. And like as, mm-hmm. I, as I look at this, this defense of the Jets, they're, they're huge up front. They're huge up front. I mean, these guys, the smallest linemen they have, I think they have 265-pound defensive end. Other than that, it's 290, 295, 300. Yeah. Like, they're, they're ginormous. And they're athletic. And they're athletic, but they don't use their athleticism, right? Mm. right? So they want to two-gap you, right? And for those that don't know what two-gap is, that means I want to get, be in my three-point stance, come off the ball, put both hands on your chest, I'll grab your chest, your, your chest uh, piece, and drive you back into the quarterback. I want to constrict – your ability to run the ball. I want to take away your the running lanes, and I want to take away your quarterback's pocket. That that's the benefit of a two gap. So when you have, usually most teams have one guy that's good at two gapping. These guys have four. <laughs> that's I mean that's what they do. That's their style. They are not generic pass rushers in the sense that they're going to go out there and try to you know, up and under. And they don't have a Michael Parsons. They don't have a yeah. D Law. They don't have a Sam Williams. They don't they don't have any of those type of guys. Like Cowboys Nation is very familiar with guys, you know, getting those one on one matchups and just making somebody just miss. That's not this team. This team wants to drive you back into the ball, you know, into the, to the quarterback or into the lap of the runner. Um, what does that do for you offensively, though? Let's talk about it in the second back, segment. Bet. I like it. Yeah, the, how about that for a tease? What? How does that change things offensively? We'll get Isaiah's full scouting report. We'll talk about this Jets defense and the matchup for the Cowboys offense when we come back with more Talking Cowboys. Todd thought it would be secure to jog in the cheetah savannah. Todd believed the big cat repellent he bought online was reliable. And now Todd is trying to be faster than this cheetah that can run 80 miles per hour. But the good news is Todd has AT&T 5G that is fast, reliable, and secure. And he learned the best thing to do is stop running and toss her the backpack with the beef stew. AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Black Rifle Coffee Company serves premium coffee to people who love America. When you drink Black Rifle Coffee, you are directly supporting veterans, law enforcement, and first responders in your community. Black Rifle's expert roasters love coffee almost as much as Texas loves football, so it makes sense that America's Coffee partnered with America's team. Go online at BlackRifleCoffee.com and fuel up with the official coffee of the Dallas Cowboys. That's BlackRifleCoffee.com to fuel up today. Cowboys fans, after that move, we've just coined the term Rowdy Replay. Let's roll back the tape. Okay, there's our mascot Rowdy cheering on the boys. And now he's on his phone, on his Bank of America mobile banking app? Staying on top of his finances with his virtual financial assistant, Erica. Bank of America's digital tools are so impressive. Cowboys fans just can't stop banking. Learn more at BankofAmerica.com slash can't stop banking. Erica is only available in the English language. You must download the latest version of the mobile banking app only available on select mobile devices message and data rates may apply member fdic welcome back into dear doctor the show where i answer life's questions with an ice cold can of dr pepper sheila let's hear from our next caller would you dear doctor my friend supported me during a tough time but what's the right gift that says thanks for being a shoulder to cry on okay this one's easy i say give her a delicious dr pepper nothing says thanks girl better than a -a one-of-a-kind soda Yes, any Dr. Pepper flavor will do. Now, just a reminder that I don't need to be a real doctor to know that Dr. Pepper is the one you deserve. Back to Talkin' Cowboys. 
Back here on Talking Cowboys in the SWBC Mortgage Studios. This segment is brought to you by Invisalign, the official smile of the Dallas Cowboys. And, of course, our show, as always, brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee Company, the official coffee of the Dallas Cowboys. Cheers from Nick Harris, John Machota, Isaiah Stamback, Chris Beam in the back. I'm Kyle Yeomans. All right, Isaiah, you've you've crunched the film. Mm -hmm. You've broken this thing down. Mm Mm-hmm. I want you to tell me about the Jets' defense, their complete scouting report, and how it could change things this week for the Cowboys' offense game plan-wise. The trash. No, I'm playing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are going to be times this year where Isaiah will say that. They uh, are compost. Who, what team did you call Asura. compost last year? I don't remember. It was a few. Yeah, I, you. He will hear it this week, it'll this, this year, sometime. I mean, it's not going to be this week, though. This team is not compost on the defense no, side. No, they are not. Uh, they have some dudes. Are they, they on offense? Uh, on offense, they they have guys, but I think it's going to be a rough night for them. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a rough night for Wilson. Um, Okay, let's get into it. Uh, so defense. So defensively, their defensive front is their strength of their team. All right, everybody can talk about Sauce Gardner all day long. Um, Sauce Gardner is is a dude, but how they utilize these guys and how he gets his opportunities come from this front. All right. And it's really the front six. I wouldn't even call it the front seven. Uh defense alignment. Uh obviously everybody knows Keenan uh who is it? Keenan? Quinn? Quinnan? Quinnan. Quinnan. Quinnan Williams. Quinnan Williams, okay. Um he's a dude, but he he's not as much of a dude as I as as, as I would expect him to be as I watch him on film. And I and I think because he has one style that I've seen, um I think he is limited. I think he's very limited. Now, is he dominant in that one way of going about it? It's, it's almost like if you took Michael Parsons and said, okay, Michael Parsons is going to line up outside, and he's going to run outside you every single time. Good luck trying to keep up. Yeah. Right? Or okay. just play linebacker like he didn't come. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so linemen, like, they'll be happy to know that he's going to do that every single time, but can you stop it? No, you probably still can't stop it majority of the times. And that's really how, you know, how, how Quentin Williams is as well. So. He's going to two-gap you. I didn't you. realize he was the third overall pick in that 2019 draft. So yeah, he was. Going. He was big time. I knew time. he was a high pick, but I didn't realize it was yes. overall. Yeah, he yeah. just got paid again. Too. There, there yeah. was a chance they were going to trade him, and Dallas was an interested team. This was back in, mm-hmm. like, this was the, the Jamal Adams trade time, oh, yeah, you yeah. know? Like, there was a there was a time where it was like Dallas was kind of throwing their hat in the <laughs> ring of, like, we would like to maybe throw something at you for Quinn and Williams. And <laughs> Jets were like, you know what? We'll hold on. So if he was in this defense, he would be used differently. Oh, man. Oh, if he was in this defense, I wouldn't say that he'd be used differently. I think that he would be a great accomplice to to Hankins. Yeah. I mean, he he does what you hope Mozzie will do. Okay. Pretty much. That's probably Interesting. The, that's probably the best way of saying it. Basically just using his strength to be Using disruptive. your strength to like be disruptive. Purely just yep. be I don't need you to... I don't need you picking a side. That's what our defense is kind of falling into right now. Yeah. We'll, we'll touch base on that in, in film room um, this week, but you know, our defense likes to jump around and like to stun a lot. There's a lot of cross. There's a ton of movement, right? So there's benefits to that when you get your matchups, but you can get out of place as well. This team isn't going to get out of place. They're always going to be where they're supposed to be, but you have to drive them off the ball. You have to use your combo blocks, your double teams to get these guys moving the opposite direction, because if you don't, they will disrupt everything you have going on in the backfield. So as we talk about a Chuma Idoga, that's a, that is a potential red flag if he can't hold the fort, because they will obviously try to expose him in that regard. Um, but that the front four of those guys is pretty doggone solid, right? All right, so 95, 93, 91, okay? Those are the main guys that you have to worry about. Um, I think the most impactful aspect of their defense are their linebackers. Mm-hmm. Dogs. Yeah. Complete, utter dogs. And one thing that we've talked about in the past is the reason why Dallas – Dallas's defense up front is so important. Why we need interior linemen that can hold the fort and demand double teams is because what? What does it do for your second level? It allows for your second level to free flow. Yeah. Well, guess what? That is They've exactly got their guy. what they do in New York. New York has their down linemen. These guys are going to two gap. You better you better get a little shoulder on them or something to per, to stop their momentum from coming forward. Otherwise, you're going to be in the quarterback's lap. But those guys are taking up your linemen so that their second level guys can free flow, and those are their playmakers. So their playmakers are that and CJ Mosley out of, out of Baltimore, uh, and then uh, Quincy Williams. So 56, 57. Hmm. So as fans, as you're watching the game, 56, 57, those dudes are dudes, and they fly around. They are. They have the energy of what I would call like a Michael Parsons. They have that energy, right? Like they're like they're tenacious, they're relentless. They are gonna they have no regard for their body. They are coming downhill. They're making a decision. They're trying to take your head off. Right? Yeah, mostly especially. Like he's a downhill beast. Yes. 
Yes. And now there's advantages to that. Yeah. There's advantages to that, sure. right? So we talk about their front four really just getting vertical, right? They just want to push, 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 let their linebackers free flow, run to the ball. But what happens when those guys are overly aggressive? They oversell. They oversell. So mm -hmm. now all of a sudden, if you can establish a running game and demand the respect of those second level guys, if you can demand the spec of Mosley, if you can just demand uh, the respect of Williams, then all of a sudden you can run your play action game all day long. And the reason being is because these guys want to play a base defense on the back end. They are a too high defense. They want to play two safeties all day, every day. There are a couple ways that I've found that you can force them out of a too high look, mm -hmm. okay? And that usually comes in the form of bunch sets. They don't want to play too high in bunch. They really don't. Um, but the, and, and for the most part, they want to play quarters coverage, which is qu cover four, right? Everybody, all their guys, the corners have a quarter, the safeties have a quarter of the field. Or they want to play cover two, right? And their corners are sitting five yards, the safeties have the, the halves. One thing that they do really well of, and it's, it's screwed the crap out of Josh Allen, is they don't like to just, just play two and just play four. They sometimes they want to play two on one side of the field and they want to play four on the other side. Or they want to play two on one side of the field and they want to play man on the other side of the field. So what Josh Allen ran into and the reason why he threw three picks the other day is because of the fact that he was seeing the front side of the coverage and he wasn't picking up that they were running a completely different coverage on the backside. Mm. So when he had guys running deep routes and backside posts and over routes, okay, yeah, I see what they're running front side. Cool, got that diagnosed. Okay, so if I see that and I know they're running cover four over here, that means that the guy's open on the backside over here. Uh, uh, uh. He's just shooting no scope. Yeah, he's just shooting over there, right? Because he's a, he's a, he was assuming yeah. that the coverage was the same on the other half of the field. They were really dividing their coverage right down the middle, right? Cover four this side, cover two backside. Man on this side. Cover two backside, right? So he was getting screwed because he wasn't diagnosing the entire play. So that's something that Dak's going to have to be uber aware of as he goes out there and starts trying to throw some of these routes because you have to see the entire field. They do a good job with their safeties of making it look like the, a base coverage when in reality this half is one coverage, that half's another. So if that's the case, there's no such way that Dak can come up to the line of scrimmage other than just watching film and knowing that it's a possibility – he can diagnose that pre-snap. That's all post-snap diagnosis, There's correct, a, there, so from you, a quarterback standpoint? So as a quarterback, when you step to the line of scrimmage, you it's a process of elimination, right? So I step to the line of scrimmage, I see two safeties, okay, automatically my mind goes to, okay, either it's cover two or cover, or cover four. four. Yeah. Usually that's where my mind goes, okay? Um, great for running the ball against. So ability to run the ball, awesome if you can get these guys moving opposite direction on the front. Okay, but they, That's easier said than done. Easier said than done when you got 300 pounds across the D-line that play with good pad level and have good strength. And the linebackers can roam free without a lineman being able to work up to them. Yeah. So Tony Pollard and you know Rico, you're going to have to make a man miss. Or you have to run through a, a guy who doesn't care about his face because he's going to come and try to, <laughs> yeah. try to take your chest out. But on the backside... Dak's gonna have to come up and really diagnose it. So pre-snap, okay, cover two, okay, that safety's a little bit, a little bit deeper than the other. Okay, I'll keep my eye on it. Okay, I snapped the ball. Now what is it? Right? It doesn't become too much of a problem when I'm in my typical drop back, but it does become a problem when I'm in play action. Because when I'm in play action, okay, I've diagnosed, okay, is it two, is it four? Okay, I snapped the ball. Now I'm doing what as a quarterback? I'm turning my back to the coverage. Right? So when I turn my back to the coverage, Right, I have my pre-snap, but now I don't get my post-snap until I get my head back around, and I have to reevaluate what that defense is within, what, half a second to make my decision based upon what I thought it was. So that's where Sounds he has terrible. To, it is terrible. It is terrible. But that's the reality, right? John's like, no thanks. You know, it's Quinn and Williams proposing <laughs> in. No, I'm good. Yeah, I was, so I was sitting there telling, talking to my wife last night when I was watching film, and she's sitting there and um, – and she's like, "What are you? What are you watching?" I was like, "I was watching the game, you know." And she's, I'm like, "Man, I showed her one pass rush." And she was like, "Man, why did he take so long?" I said, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa!" I said, "You have maybe two and a half seconds." Yeah. Like maybe two and a half seconds. She looked at me like I was crazy. I was like, "No, no, no, count this out, count this out." Because she on the play, it looked like he had all day long. But in reality, uh, Josh Allen ended up getting sacked on a two and a half second drop. Hmm. I'm it, like, it comes at you fast. It, yeah. it, I mean, they put the clock on the Dallas defense getting after Daniel Jones, and it was like 1.8 yep. and 2.3. And they had the clock on it on the NBC broadcast the other day. It's not too far off from this New York Jets front. And I think the secondary benefit from it, I mean, you've got a guy like Whitehead that yeah. had the three picks because of bad decisions, the decision making and, and confusing a quarterback. Dak's going to have to be on his reads this week. Yeah, yeah. And, and one thing that Josh Allen did, and honestly, 
there's going to be a huge opportunity for Dallas's defense as well because the Jets' offense, I know we already hit on that yesterday, but these guys push everything down the field. Yeah. Everything's way down the field. Like They want to sit back, and that's why I think there's going to be another six or seven sack game for this defense. Um, but the same thing with, with Buffalo. They were pushing everything down the field, and that's not the weakness of this defense. The weakness of this defense is right in the middle of their defense because they're relying so heavily on Mosley. They're relying so heavily on Williams at a second level. Both of those guys are, are being asked to cover the entire middle of the field, and they can't because they really want to play the run. So a lot of slants, drags, trying to get those guys out in space. Overs. Yeah. Right? Overs should destroy these guys. Yeah. Okay. A little Tony Pollard angle route. Yeah, get I me mean, going. That's what so when we talk <laughs> so when we talk about B Cooks, right? That's what B Cooks does really well in yeah. this offense. At least that we what we saw in, in preseason and what we saw at camp is a lot of over routes. And week one. Yeah, right. Yeah. Lots of overs. So overs. Uh, Ferguson, okay, you should be killing them on on, on little post routes. You should be killing them on corner routes, like all those type of things. That's in that middle portion of the field, right? Shallows or should be good, right? If you can get those guys biting, play action is going to be a, a real thing this week. So let me ask you, because I, I don't feel like any of this is successful without being able to utilize the play action, which mm -hmm. means you got to get the running you game gotta going. You got to run, yeah. So how do you get the running game going against yeah, so a front six like this? You're going to have to. I would come out personally in 12 personnel, and it's just bully ball. Mm -hmm. Is bully. You're big. You're strong. We know what you do. Would you We're going to get you moving. 13 person. No, I'm not going 13. Oh, okay. They did, have, they did have a lot of plays in 13, though, on Sunday night. <laughs> on Sunday night. Where they were pulling Jake Ferguson and putting him in the C-gap, and he Correct. was getting it done. Correct. You know? I really that, like but, Jake Ferguson's ability to block and his willingness to willingness. block yeah. In, yeah. This, in this scheme and what he was able to do. Uh, in that game on on Sunday night, plus New York offensively ran a lot of thirteen personnel. There's some some teams going back to that that heavy tight end package yeah. to be able to try and push the ball. McCarthy down. I would, I would, is not been scared of it. I would no. go I would go twelve, and I would not come out in a deuce set. So a deuce set is when a, you have deuce a tight Vaughn? end. Yeah, no, not deuce Vaughn. We have a okay. tight end on each side, right? I would put these guys yeah. more in a wing set, meaning mm -hmm. that hey, I have one tight end on line of scrimmage, I have another tight end right in his hip pocket, and the reason being because it gives you an ability to run your combo blocks. So you don't want to run straight down here at these guys. Don't, don't. I mean, you're going to have to try it, but the success rate is probably slim to none against these guys. They're just too big. They're too strong. This is what they do well. They want you to run at their face. Like, come come downhill. I, I want you to come downhill. Right? I'm going to two-gap you. I'm going to throw one guy one direction. I'm going to get my arm out there, and then my linebackers are filling the gaps. Right? They're going to knock the crap out of your chin strap. So you want to get these guys moving sideways. The linemen don't do well moving sideways, but what happens is if you can't get off of the defensive linemen, Though, again, Mosley and Williams are literally free-flowing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're coming 100 miles per hour, and they're knocking the crap out of you at the line of scrimmage, if not behind the line of scrimmage. So if you have those combo blocks by your tight ends, now you can outflank the defensive line, right? And your tight ends can now work up and seal those guys as they free flow on the second level. Now you have some lanes because those cornerbacks don't want to come up and hit. Those cornerbacks are playing out in coverage, right? You can run your guys off as if they're running a route and get them out the picture and really have an opportunity to get some big plays on the ground. Williams had 10 tackles in Sunday night football, or excuse me, Monday night football for the Jets, and he was ranked as the seventh out of 73 linebackers. So, I mean, the, the the second level of that Jets defense is is very good, but it's mostly because of what Quinton Williams is doing up yeah. front and how they're paving the way. Consuming. John, when you look at the Jets defense and, and you've kind of done your study on them, how do they compare to some of the defenses that the Cowboys have seen in the past? Because Giants had a solid front seven, but they didn't necessarily have the experience on the outside. Before that, you go back to San Francisco. Of course, San Francisco in the playoff game had a phenomenal defense, and that's why they did what they did in the last couple of years. But where do you think the Jets' defense, now that you've kind of looked at it a little bit, kind of ranks along the lines of some of the past defenses Cowboys' offenses have gone against? I think it's up there with all of them, and that's why it's going to be good to see because it is going to be that type of a playoff type defense that you're going against that, let's be honest, the last two times that the Cowboys were in the playoffs, they got sent home because they played probably the best defense in the NFL. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot of us wondering, okay, then how are they gonna how are they gonna do against one of these this type of test? Also coming off of a game that you can factor in a lot of first time Mike McCarthy is a play caller, sloppy weather. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna have that. You're inside, you're at home, you're gonna be pretty hyped up. I mean talking to Brandon Cooks at his locker, um, after like the whole group left, uh he, you know, he was asked about like how much they even showed on, on offense. And he was like, no, 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 we haven't really shown it. There's a lot that we haven't even get, come close to getting to yet. And so going against a, uh, an elite defense like this, like I don't think they're San Francisco elite, but I think they're one of the best, one of the better defenses in the league. So 
uh, just to see Dak and some of these wide receivers, seeing Jalen Tolbert, seeing the kind of success he can have. Um, but I also wonder with a guy like like a Jordan Whitehead, um, you know, I think this is his fifth or sixth year in the league, never had more than two picks in, in an entire season, and then he has three in one game. Is he is he on a hot hand? Did he just, was he in the right place at the right time? Yes. Is that, does right that place, carry, right time. Does that carry over? Uh, <laughs> And then there's Sauce Gardner back there. That, that so, and then of all the stuff, obviously that Isaiah said, there's just there is going to be a lot of stuff to evaluate Dak off of this game, maybe more so than than the last game. So that's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how I kind of look at it. Is just like, all right, this will give us a chance early on to see how this this offense will stack up against a, a defense that that's certainly going to be better than the Giants was. Would you say this is an elite defense that they're going up against? I think he has a chance to be. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it's super I mean, early, but I mean. Yeah, there's a lot of question marks about their quarterback, but if they're going to have the type of success that they expect to have, uh, well, let's say even if they had Aaron Rodgers, sure, they weren't going to get to whatever level that they wanted to. Like, uh, you know, if you're making picks at the beginning of the year, there's a lot of people that thought, you know, Jets could win that division, possibly the Super Bowl. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers is a big part of it, but it's also because of that defense. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, so like I said, it's not San Francisco's, it's not Dallas's. Um, they, you put they, they went into this season realizing that hey, if we have a quarterback. We have a chance because yeah. our defense is so good. Yeah. Do would you put them up there with let's say here's some of the San Francisco, Dallas, Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Uh, New England's defense is still legitimate. Yeah. Pittsburgh got a good defense. Washington's got a solid front seven. Miami's got a good defense. Baltimore always does. Would you put them up there kind of with the 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 Eagles and the the yeah. Cowboys and the Forty Nine ers closer than some of those high, other but teams? I think it'd be in like the next tier. Yeah. The um, second tier down. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's certainly close for sure. I, I I look at the Cowboys even. I just think that there's just more playmakers yeah. all, on on all three levels. So that's the only reason why I wouldn't put them there. But most of the times, anytime you have you know a defensive head coach, your defense is probably going to be pretty good. And if yeah. it's not, then that coach isn't going to be here very long. That's a that's a, this is going to be such a fun challenge for this offense. Like you said, the last two times they've been bounced from the playoffs has been one of the best defenses in the NFL. Here's a great early look at it, and then you got a couple. Couple more down the road with Philadelphia and 49ers and the Patriots and everything down the road as well. So it gets uh, it doesn't get much easier for this Cowboys offense to try and find that rhythm early in the season. When we come back though, on talking Cowboys, who's the most polarizing figure in the NFL right now without Aaron Rodgers and without Tom Brady? Plus, uh, let's talk about Dak Prescott being the most tenured player in the NFL, tenured quarterback, I should say in the NFL when we come back right after this on to more Talking Cowboys. They say champions are remembered, but legends are never forgotten. United Ag and Turf offers a winning lineup of John Deere equipment built to tackle any challenge on and off the field. Legendary John Deere tractors, combines, residential mowers, commercial mowers, compact construction equipment, gator utility vehicles, and a full line of golf and sports turf equipment. United Ag and Turf, the official Ag and Turf equipment supplier of the Dallas Cowboys. Visit unitedagandturf.com to find a location near you. Are you ready to take coffee off your grocery list forever? Black Rifle Coffee Club is here to help. As a coffee club member, you'll get your favorite coffees roasted, packaged, and shipped to your door free of charge on your preferred schedule. Set it, forget it, and never run low on coffee again. Members also get exclusive deals on coffee, products, and discounts from partner brands. Ease your mind and let Black Rifle worry about your coffee supply. Go to BlackRifleCoffee.com to join the coffee club today. It's the official men's skincare brand of the Dallas Cowboys, Jack Black. And right now, Cowboys fans can get 15% off their $75 order. Plus, because every deal needs a playmaker, your order will include a free five-piece skincare set and free shipping. The Jack Black Playmaker is four of Jack's favorites in a full-sized intense therapy lip balm. Make a play for the playmaker at GetJackBlack.com slash Cowboys with the code CowboysVIP. That's Get Jack Black. Black.com slash Cowboys with the code CowboysVIP. Todd thought it would be secure to jog in the cheetah savannah. Todd believed the big cat repellent he bought online was reliable. And now Todd is trying to be faster than this cheetah that can run 80 miles per hour. But the good news is Todd has AT&T 5G that is fast, reliable, and secure. And he learned the best thing to do is stop running and toss her the backpack with the beef stew. AT&T 5G. Fast, reliable, secure. It's not complicated. 5G requires compatible plan and device. 5G may not be available in your area. See att.com slash 5G for you for details. Back to Talkin' Cowboys. 
Back here on Talking Cowboys, presented by Quaker Oats, a super trusted superfood. Quaker Oats, the official oatmeal sponsor of the Dallas Cowboys. Talking Cowboys, brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee Company. And I, I saw something from our old friend David Hellman, of course, of DallasCowboys.com, the former beat writer, good friend of John. And, and, man, he's on this NFL on Fox podcast. We're really happy for Dave. He's doing phenomenal work out there. And he, he put up a, a – it was a graphic, and it was Dak Prescott is now the most tenured quarterback in the NFL. He's been with the team the longest. He's continued to, to be with the Cowboys for the longest amount of time that any quarterback in the NFL has been with a certain team. That's crazy. Nick, does that give any sort of advantage whatsoever to being the most tenured? It's it's an interesting stat because it feels like just yesterday he was one of the young guns in the league. It, it is crazy. Whenever I saw that yesterday, I was like, wow, like you posted that gif of like... <laughs> it's Keenan Thompson. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's very much how I felt about it too. Advantage? Um... If there is, you could say just uh, experiencing and, and knowing what to expect when you walk in the building. You know, even let, let's look at Aaron Rodgers' case. You know, mm -hmm. he's had what was it, 18 years in Green Bay, and then um, you know walks into a new situation in, in New York, um, pretending he's healthy. Walking into a new situation in New York, he's having to get used to a new system, a new home stadium, you know, a new um, and new weapons around him. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, he's still Aaron Rodgers. He's going to have more experience than Dak Prescott. At the end of the day, he's going to be able to overcome that a lot quicker. So it's like. Yeah, there's an advantage of just knowing what to expect when you walk in the door every Sunday, but I don't think it's one that decides wins and losses. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just the Dallas Cowboys brand yeah. and everything that comes with being the Cowboys quarterback. <laughs> to be experienced through that, uh, I'll just use the saying that I've heard him say a bunch, is that uh, water off a duck's back, like allowing things to just move on. And, and he said that early in his career, and I'm sure that he did deal with it as well as pretty much anybody could but then there's another thing of just like every year that goes by there's just certain things that happen that you're going to be able to handle better because you're like yeah I, I get it. it's i gotta just deal with this like i don't know i'm just gonna let me think of an example oh i don't know like trading for trey lance uh you probably <laughs> handle that a little bit better now than maybe you would have handled it earlier in his career there's just a lot of stuff that comes with being the cowboys uh quarterback the thing i always say is that like i don't believe tom brady wins seven super bowls if mm -hmm. he's then his entire career is with the dallas cowboys i just mm -hmm. think that there's so many other things that come with it that i think they would it's a lot for anybody mentally whatever you can stay off social media and do all that but there's still it's it's going to be you can't live in a bubble you know there's just always going to be stuff that that you hear and and it's it's not the easiest to deal with so yes obviously to your point all the stuff on the field but i think of even off the field stuff i just being the Cowboys franchise quarterback is is just it's not for everybody, you know. It's it's it, it there's more to it than than it is for a lot of the other organizations. How many Super Bowls does Tom Brady win if he's the quarterback of the Cowboys his whole career? Think, uh, thinking about the teams that he would have had. Okay, the entire years. time, including the time he was with the Bucks. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So Say entire career. Three to five. Okay. Do you know what years? Oh <laughs> seven. Uh. Oh seven, maybe. Yeah. That would that's a possibility. Uh, 14, 14, 16, 16. maybe. But that's tough. You got to be so bad in fifteen to get the draft pick in sixteen. So maybe yeah. they never even get that down that level. Yeah. I don't know. Is Bill Belichick get to come with him during all? Of yeah, that? that's a good question mark too. Yeah, that would be nice. No, he doesn't. So yeah, yeah it'd be then tough. if it, if there's yeah no Bill, then yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in that yeah. probably three to five range. Yeah, that, that, I, I could see that. It would be interesting to see Bill coaching for with, with Jerry. <laughs> Like it, that just, would be fascinating. I, there's a lot Isaiah, you could say there. Isaiah Isaiah's like, I'm not going to say yeah, anything. No I'm going to stay off to the side here. What it, kind of to John's point, I mean, there's, there's really not a more polarizing figure in sports. I mean, there are polarizing figures in sports around, but the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys is always up toward the top of the list. And without Tom Brady, without now Aaron Rodgers <laughs> active in 2023, where does Dak rank on that list in terms of the most polarizing individuals in sports? Because you could put up, I mean, LeBron on the NBA side, Kevin Durant probably NBA side. Steph Curry. Steph sure. Curry, oh, yeah, for sure, no doubt. Uh, golf, there's Jimmy not – Jimmy Butler. I mean, t Tiger's always been that guy, but is he that guy right this second? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Shohei. Shohei in baseball, that's about the only baseball guy you would get. I mean, it's tough. Like, Dak's up there in terms of those guys. Maybe Joe Burrow now, Patrick Mahomes. I mean, Mahomes, those, those guys Mahomes are up there. Is number one in the NFL. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, Dak, as the quarterback for the Cowboys, is always there. The eyes are on no, him. No, closing in on so. Dak, though, for this is Micah Parsons. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I could see that. <clears throat> I, would, I would put Tyreek above Dak. 
right now just Would with you? all of the mess that he loves to talk and he backs it up yeah. it's it's he's starting to become kind of a figure down there in south when we Beach. talk about polarizing mm -hmm. like i have to take the brand off of it why because the brand bears majority of the weight of the polarization of the polarization in yeah. regards to dak that's fair because the cowboys are the most polarizing Correct. team in the nfl all those other individuals you mentioned they're polarizing and their the media follows them because them mm -hmm. yeah and then what they've done so from that regard I think the brand bears more polarizing weight on Dak than Dak does on the brand. Tyreek Hill made a brand for himself. It don't matter where he goes. Patrick Mahomes, freaking Kansas City. You know, <laughs> we got uh, Burrow. He's in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. You know, LeBron doesn't matter where he goes. Right? You know, so, so he's talking about some of these guys. I like guess the player that you're following. I don't know if Dak's hit that yet, but he has a great chance to this year. I mean, I mean, he's already in that spot of, you know, he can retire after the season and. If he wants one of those top TV jobs, he's getting it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's I'm, just that's one of those. It's those that Cowboys slash, you know, like all the former players and and stuff with like Duke that they get all these TV jobs and things like that. And and the reason I bring that up is because sometimes you're even more, you become even more known for that than you were even from your your playing days. So I, when the polarizing part, I, I do agree with you on that. The Cowboys brand. There's good and bad with it, you know. Like, no like I sit there and I say, oh, you know, he, you know, he's had a lot to deal with, whatever. The Cowboys brand has also made him a lot of money, Absolutely. too. Yes, it has. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, so there, you know, there's the give and take of that. But I just think he's just wired the right way mm -hmm. to, to, to hand, handle it. to handle that. That's why I don't know. It'd been kind of interesting. I know it's not good for the Cowboys probably if he did this, but after getting done watching that quarterback series on Netflix, I would have kind of liked to see Dak on there yeah. just to see, because there's a lot of off the field stuff, like being back at home and things like that. I think they did a great job on it uh, from three different quarterback perspectives and that, but it would be interesting to see how the Cowboys, but then, you know, when he's asked about it, yeah. he was like, yeah, no, we get, we get enough coverage here, being <laughs> the, you know, with the Cowboys, which is true. Which is very, very true. And I think we've, we've talked about this enough and, uh, and by we, I mean, just Cowboys nation, like there's, there's very few quarterbacks that could handle this job as well as Dak Prescott right. does. Yeah. Uh, there are very few guys that can handle that, that level of pressure, that level in, of intensity from a fan base that is as passionate as the Cowboys. And that's what makes it great. That's what makes the Cowboys nation great is the fact that they are passionate about it, but it does bring some ups and it brings some downs and he's got to be able to ride the wave with it. Hey, the way his face looked and just the way he answered those questions on yeah. that pre game interview with melissa stark like it was, was like locked in. yeah we're not we're not doing any type of ads right yeah, now for, did you that? like that campbell's like chunky that soup was, like it was like he isaiah can he can uh i was i was irritated by that yeah really? he can he can attest to it i was sitting there i yeah, was just i was, I was, I like, was not happy the dumbest thing i've ever seen it was weird no yeah. we, like i get that tv is tv and they have a you know obligation to show to try to, yeah but like come on he's That's at work yeah he's at work yeah, they, he's at work. That's he, like the he, locked in. That's a sacred time he's for players. At work. This is not preseason. No, it's not preseason where you're trying to, you know, kill time. And no, this is he has prepared all week for this opportunity. Like, get and out. He of looked face. like he was you ready got, to go. Yeah, you got you got post game for that. Yeah, you got post game for that. Go yeah. talk to coach as he's coming out the tunnel. He has an obligation to do that. That's sound. That's contractual. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that, talking to a coach is different yeah. than talking to your franchise yeah. quarterback seconds before he takes the field. Now that that that. A specific interview was pre-recorded. I don't. I mean, just, just to pull the curtain back, that was not a live mm -hmm. interview right as they were about to walk onto still the field. Like it. it was probably 20 minutes prior to that. It was probably before they went back in the locker room. But still, like that's pre-game stretching. That yeah. should be a no touch zone. As a, I mean, as a player, be, I don't like it. I'll say that. That should be off limits. Yeah, I'm not even as a member of the media. I shouldn't say this, but like I'm, I'm even good with if you don't do the coaches either. Yeah, honestly. I really. I mean, I, and I'm. I guess. Not getting anything I'm not thinking it. about it as much for the NFL. I, I think for me, it's more of just like NBA playoff games. Like you just so rarely get anything that you're even like, whoa, okay, wow, oh, that's what they're doing. Like it's just like that was they're miserable, misber, miserable to a certain extent that they have to do it. But they're also like a lot of these coaches. This is maybe the only chance they're going to be in, in like this deep in the playoffs and things like. I don't know. Like I'm just and I, like I said, you rarely the return on investment is generally not great. I mean, I've it's got gotten to the stories. point in the NBA where one of the the most talked about ones is just the the fact of how Greg Popovich blows off the reporter. You know, mm -hmm. it's not even about yeah. like did you get anything. It's just that oh look at how entertaining that is. Like he totally made that reporter look like an idiot. And you're just like, well why why is this even being done anymore? You know, it's so, like Pop and then Quinn Snyder, the head coach for the Atlanta Hawks. He oh, blinks right. like five. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, yeah. the interview. Yeah. And that's starting it's, to pick it, up some steam. Nothing ever hilarious. good comes out of it, <laughs> honestly. Just put a count to it. Ding, ding, yeah. Yeah. Ding, yeah. Ding, ding. I tried one time. It's impossible. Like, that's how fast he's blinking it during an interview. So, it's wild. So Jason Witten has been the one in, in mm-hmm. previous years that before some of those Sunday night games was the one that did an interview. And that's the most, like... Because Jason Witten, like Dak, very, very media friendly, but that's the most I've ever seen him be like, yeah, I'm, I'll give you these answers, but I really just want to run away from this as soon as possible. Yeah. I don't want to be here right now, yeah. but yeah. It's it's rough. I mean, John tweeted out a video of me last year with Mike McCarthy in Denver. I mean, yeah. that was that was a part. Uh, I mean, that was that was my learning opportunity with with that whole situation. But yeah, I mean, things happen, uh, and and you gotta you gotta roll with the punches, both from a media standpoint, got a job but also to do. from a player standpoint. You both have a job to do, and you gotta get through it. But I I just didn't like it pregame, halftime, and postgame, all you want. But pregame, especially with the franchise quarterback. Let's not do that. Let's not do that, NBC. All right. When we, or, well, we're done for the day. How about that? It flew by. I thought we had one more segment left. I'm trying to keep John around. I want to get his his predictions. That's going to do it for us tomorrow. Say it with your chest Friday. Bring the energy. We'll give our pickums. We'll already have Johns in the bank, and we will get you ready for the Week 2 matchup with the New York Jets. For Chris Beam in the back, Isaiah Stanback, John Machota, Nick Harris, I'm Kyle Yeoman saying so long from the star in Frisco. We'll see you tomorrow on more Talking Cowboys. This has been a production of DallasCowboys.com and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?